Hello, everyone. This is Val Massey coming at you, well, live if you're watching it now, not live if you're watching the video on demand later. Uh, this is the last episode of our Meet the Team series, except, uh, well, it's the last one where I'm asking the questions. Um, the next one will be November 4th when I am in the hot seat and Brooks Brown, our CEO, will be interviewing me. So it kind of come full circle because our first Meet the Team episode was me interviewing Brooks. Um, this has been a lot of fun. I hope that all of you have enjoyed it. And let's get started with today's episode. It is Mark Favreau. And the only reason that I know how to pronounce that, even with my terrible Texas accent, is because of John Favreau, the director, who directed one of my favorite movies, Elf. Anyway, Mark is the uh, head of game design, and we're going to get to know him a little bit better. So say hello, Mark. Hello, everybody. Good evening. <laughs> uh, not related to John Favreau whatsoever, but uh, yeah, he does have a, a few good movies uh, in his resume, I would say. He does. He does. Well, let's talk about your resume and the cool stuff that you've done. Uh, you were born in Montreal, in Montreal but now live yeah. in Berlin. Yeah, in Berlin. So how did you, <laughs> what what caused that migration? What's the connection? Uh, I've actually been in Europe for almost eight years now. Uh, so it's basically... Uh, getting in, in, in connection with, with studios uh, that need some game design help and, uh, and coming over uh, to uh, kickstart some processes in the beginning uh, as an AI specialist, but uh, uh, a lot of also direction roles and whatnot. It actually started in, in Stockholm, uh, yeah, pretty much eight years ago now. Uh, so I did a couple capitals in Europe and, and right now we're yeah, stationed in Berlin. All right, so let's, let's back up to before all the moving and all of that, when you were growing up in Montreal, did, did you like school? Uh, and were you a good student? Like what classes did you like and what were you like? No, I don't want any of that. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'd say I like school. I mean, you know, you, you need to go through it. So I guess I did my time, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> But uh, no, the, the the classes that I would like the most, I guess, was uh, history and geography and that kind of stuff. Uh, I guess I was really good in math uh, up to a certain point as well. But um, I don't know. I guess the creativity always kind of got the better of me in the really maybe let's call it nine to five or I don't know nature of school very square. Uh, probably didn't sit well with me that much. But then again, you know, I ended up doing uh, many years to get the, uh, my diploma and all of that. So, so yeah. When did you discover the joy of playing video games? Like, what was your first video game that you really fell in love with? I was, I was pretty young um, and uh, pretty sure it was Pong. Uh, cause I was pretty young, but, uh, uh, I guess, uh, you know, it's a pretty, you can't mistake it for, for anything else. And there wasn't that, that much else around. That was my first contact. I can't say that I remember that I was completely stoked about it, but after that, it was, it was on my mom's side, I guess, uh, she had a big family and the younger ones, uh, you know, they were all about the new fads and the new consoles that were coming out. And I don't even remember what the name of that one was. I probably just was Pong. That was also the name of the console. But, um, but then there was something called Intellivision, a uh, neat little game there where you had the little naval gameplay where, uh, you know, you needed to kind of sneak in your boats to try to invade the, the other player's base, which, you know, was more or less like an early RTS of sorts. Uh, and then, of course, uh, on the ColecoVision uh, Quest for Tires, I think it was called. You were a caveman riding a stone wheel, <laughs> bashing people over the head. And mm -hmm. the graphics were kind of neat for, for back then. So that I've never heard first, of that one. That I remember vividly. Yeah, that 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 game cranked me up. Uh, so yeah, that was the early days. Yeah. 
So what's your favorite game of all time to date? Like, I, I think that, I mean, you know, I think we all have probably several favorite games for different reasons but let's say that the one that really probably kicked me down that slope of of becoming uh you know involved in the game industry uh would have to be the the original fantasy star on on the sega master system uh it's a jrpg uh but it really had a nice twist where um the dungeons that you would go i mean otherwise it was a standard you know your little troop that was going on 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 the over overhead map but the dungeons were that eye of the beholder esque uh fake 3d uh and and they were pretty tough you could get lost in some of them so the game was fairly forgiving uh, unforgiving even though you know uh, it was a jrpg so yeah Probably that and one. that was the one that made you think, okay, this is what I, I want to do. I want to make those games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's where something happened, I guess, and and then I kept on digging. Now, can you just play a game and enjoy it? Like, I have a nephew who is a musician, and he dissects every note and... It's like, can you just listen to a song and enjoy it? Is that possible yeah. for you? Or do you look at it it's like that critical eye is always there where you're going, that could have been smoother. This doesn't feel right. I would have done this instead. Yeah, I think that uh, there's a little bit of both. Um, I think that as you grow older and more experienced in the game industry, it's uh, directly opposite to the, the amount of time that you can actually spend playing games. Um, but, <laughs> yes. you know, f for your general culture, you still want to keep on top of everything, you know, the new things and, and, and you know, stay informed and stay, stay current. So, you know, often i'm gonna pick up a game and and know that i'm not gonna go through it i mean i don't know what's the size of my steam library uh, nowadays but it, you know may need to get a taste of it see what makes it tick maybe like you're saying see mm, that's kind of weird that's kind of odd or or you know sometimes this is very good for xyz reason even though again i mean then maybe you just get sucked in and uh and then you end up finishing it, and you enjoy and, and enjoying it a lot. Uh, and then, and then on the flip side, sometimes there's just title that hey, I want to play this, uh, and and then yeah, you just kind of jump in there. Even more so if it's multiplayer, I would say, because then you're also experiencing it with you know family and friends or strangers. But then it takes another dimension. Uh, so yeah, a little bit of both, I would say. Well, that's good. Um... Have you ever considered a different career? Did you ever try to do anything but be a game designer? Or have you thought about it? Like, okay, I'm sick of this. I'm going to go roast peanuts. If I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's probably what would happen to me if, I, <laughs> if I'd ever stop being a, a game designer. I think I'd become a farmer. So it's, I have a little farm something quiet i actually have a as a hobby uh, whenever i have an occasion even uh, even now uh, you know i always have something uh, growing uh, be it herbs for cooking or you know when i have a little bit more space uh, full on garden uh, i think there's uh, okay we're nice... going to come back to that because now i have questions for you but that's <laughs> further down when we're talking about something else um so let's stick with the pride in and satisfaction in, 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 in harvesting stuff that you've grown yourself and and then, you know, carrot from your garden. There's nothing that tastes as good as that. So you attended the School of Digital Arts, Animation and Design in Montreal. Did yeah. that curriculum adequately prepare you for what you do now? Uh, yeah, I'd say um, it was somewhat of a price of entry as well, I think, in the industry. Uh, you know, once you have that diploma, it also means that first, you know, there's a selection before you can even get your foot in the, in the, in the school. And then you also 
slug through it. It was pretty intense back then. Uh, it was very condensed course. Um, and uh, at the same time, I'd say we were a little bit guinea pigs. I think it was the first cohort where there was an option to actually do game design. Um, so I ended up doing both because uh, technically my, 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 my diploma is an, as an artist. Uh, but beside the first gig in the industry where, you know, as a summer job, I was uh, optimizing uh, baseball player head scans so that the vertices would be at the right place so that the deformation would actually be right. Uh, besides that, it's been all design since then. Yeah, I mean, it was not uh, the first time that I went to, to school uh, either. I had went to school maybe 10 years prior to that uh, in Florida, but that's a, that's another story. It was not the... Oh, at full sale? <laughs> no, no, it was it was some scammy school. Uh, ended up uh, as, as, as like a, in court anyways. And, uh, okay, yes. I did get some money back uh, <laughs> many years afterwards. We but uh, no, so a couple of stabs at, uh, at becoming a... You know, at gaining entry, access to the game industry, I guess. But that one, the that was the right one. It was it was a good time at that. Uh, it's the acronym for the school. Game uh, design curriculums are are relatively new. I mean, that wasn't around when I first started in the game industry. That's, you know, yeah. yeah you could go to school and learn to be a programmer, and as a programmer, you could get a job at a game studio, but. They didn't teach game design back in the day. That's that's pretty new stuff. It's because it's a, it's a new trade, right? Uh, I mean, 20 years ago, it was, uh, or even maybe a little bit before that, uh, everyone would kind of learn on the job. And, and at some point, you'd specialize in specificities, uh, level design, maybe AI, or, or probably a mix of all of that way back when. Uh, so yeah, and, and even the engines were not that standardized. So, you know, it was hard to, and they were evolving rapidly, the technology as well. So it was hard to get a curriculum together, I would say. Uh, let's talk about some of your past projects. Cause you've worked on some really cool stuff that people will recognize the names of yeah. those things. So, you know, yeah. just kind of give a, a little rundown and which, which was your favorite or which were your favorite projects that you've worked on? I've always asked, uh, I, I mean, originally, I think I'm a, I'm an indie developer f at heart. Uh, <laughs> so, so the thing that I liked the most, the project that I liked the most doing definitely has to be child of light hands down. Um, it was it was weird times, I guess. Um, THQ Montreal just went down under, got bought back by Ubisoft. Um, they were pitching all the projects that were going on on the floor at, at Ubisoft Montreal back then, so that they would get all the stuff from THQ there and and kind of distribute us uh, to, to to all those projects and. Um, one of the assistants, I guess, they really wanted me in to to jump in with them. But um, I saw, you know, the the prototype for Child of Light. It was fairly early in the production when I got in touch with those guys, and I was like, "Ooh, I want to get in there." And I think that the people on the project also really liked uh, my personality and what I could bring. So the rest is history, as they say. Uh, we went in there for I don't know, close to two years or. Maybe yeah. And what it was, was it about uh, that one that that you liked so much? It is somewhat of a of a love letter to <laughs> to making games. I would say that game and and it's definitely what was happening on the floor as well, right? It was really crafts people, you know, exercising exercising their craft and and as good as they could do it within the limits of the engine that we were using and all of that. But at the same point, at the same time, it was, it was very much about, you know, a core gameplay loop. And so it was very, you know, making games in its purest form without all the shenanigans that you might expect with <laughs> bigger productions and, 
and bigger studios and whatnot. Even even I guess we were in the fun house, uh, which is like a separate building, separate atmosphere. It was not really uh, a Ubisoft game to some extent, if you want to put it. I say way. it all the time that I love being part of a small scrappy team more than yeah. being part of a big corporate machine. Yeah. Uh, what brought you to C9? How'd you wind up here? How'd you meet Brooks? He's the warp uh, thread. I've said this before. He's the warp thread and the tapestry that is C9. So at some point, yeah. your paths and we cross. Funnily enough, I think we all kind of like were not that many contacts away from 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 one another, the, the core team that we have right now. Um, I was working actually with, uh, with a studio in, in Ukraine. Uh, and then, you know, the events that we know came to pass so that came to an end abruptly so you know word kind of got out that they i was available and and i was looking and i was also kind of interacting with my network um and then at some point i talked with carol uh, which is our tech artist uh, senior tech artist i guess i'm not sure i don't want to butcher his title but uh, and we had worked together actually on Child of Light. Uh, and he's like, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I might have something that's right down your alley. So, um, so yeah, quickly uh, I, I got pulled into a meeting with Fred, which uh, you guys saw a few weeks back, and, and Brooks. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, it's a forgettable uh, Fred. Yeah. So it was, I mean, right away I understood what, the ambition was and how they wanted to go uh, about it. And I thought that it was pretty interesting, uh, both the ambition and the challenge that uh, would be in store for me uh, by jumping in. So um, I think it was uh, it was pretty much a, a, a match made in heaven uh, at that point. So here I am. We're happy to have you. As the head of game design, what are your responsibilities? What's a a typical work day or a typical week like for you? Uh, my responsibilities would be to um, establish uh, the the vision for what we're trying to achieve uh, with uh, with the, the the rest of the leadership group of uh, of the game department. Uh, of course, we're a small uh, group right now, so um, I get to do a little bit of everything, which includes jumping in the engine as well. Sorry, I got something that's Are you okay. Me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know, it's a, it's it's the fun part of being part of small teams. Um, you, you just need to pretty much everything needs to be done. So, uh, so as much as sometimes I can be pulled into uh, high level discussions uh, for, you know, where we're going or what we're doing with XYZ, the next minute I'm, I'm, you know, jumping into uh, Unreal to uh, put, you know, different level of difficulties into uh, specific levels, test levels that we're working in right now. So, um, we're in a pretty big recruitment spree right now. So there's a lot of looking at what the, 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 the good people out there uh, that are hopefuls uh, review their offerings, I guess, see what's happening there. And uh, yeah, so so more often than not, there's just like a bunch of, of pots on the stove. So just making sure <laughs> nothing burns. <laughs> what do you look for when you're looking at cvs for game designers so it's, sometimes people are really good on paper and then you meet them and you're like oh, not a good cultural fit with the company or they just and even with the ones that look good on paper and and you think okay this is the right person like it's still kind of taking a step of faith that they of really course. can deliver and that they can share the vision because even say, Oh, we're going to make this first person shooter. One person's idea of a first person shooter could be completely different from someone else. So what yeah. are the key things that you look for when you're looking at those resumes? Yeah. Um, I think that the bigger pillar uh, that I'm after um, is, is, is to get a feel for the, technical savviness uh, of the person that I'm talking with. 
so that whenever they have an idea or something that they want to do or express, um, they don't need to rely on someone else to do it for them, but they can actually, you know, disappear in their bubble and, and, and come back with, you know, even if it's not pretty or nothing, something that's interactive and in the engine um, that, you know, it's, it's, if, if an image is a thousand words, well, a prototype is a million word, <laughs> words, right? So that's definitely from a, from a game design level design point of view, that's, that's one of the, my first stop. Um, I like, uh, I like people that have, a, you know, a certain curiosity that permeates from, from the, the conversation that you can have uh, with them and, and also looking at their resume and their LinkedIn and whatnot, their interests. Uh, you can see uh, people that have been around once or twice, even if, if it's for a junior position, uh, even. Um, I think that's also going to reflect into how they approach um, responsibilities that are given to them. So, I've talked with so many aspiring game designers or people who want to aspire to be game designers, not even aspiring yet, uh, who kind of have this misconception that I like Call of Duty. I'm good at Call of Duty. I can make video games. I can be a yeah. game designer. Yeah. And every once in a while, it's true. But what are some steps that people could take to go from, I like this game, I'm good at this game, I think I could make one, to mm -hmm. actually teaching themselves some skills and some, you know, some some activities that they could do to actually m make it more likely that they could at least get a foot in a door. Yeah. Um, maybe, you know, we, we're going to get a, a boost from the algorithm there, but YouTube is probably your bigger friend at that point, uh, you know, definitely for Unity and Unreal, but I'm sure I didn't look for things like Godot or, or whatnot, but there's, you know, such vibrant communities and the, and the engines have been dissected in little itsy bits of, of, of content for whatever that you're trying to do at that specific moment. So, um, I mean, today it's very easy to pick it up uh, if you want and there's so much resources out there and then there's also often you know communities if you if you get a you know you get a, a login into a udn and whatnot uh generally or even the unity um, forums you'll have people that are not paid by them they just developers just like you are hopeful that i've actually banged their head on the problem that you might be uh, comforting at that point and they have a solution or they'll have a, you know, some hints or some direction that he, that they can put you, that he can set you on. Uh, back in my days, I remember I had a brick. The thing was, you know, massive, like 1800 pages for 3D Studio 4 before it become max. Uh, <laughs> and I went through it. Uh, so it, it was other days. Uh, and, you know, you had to buy those books. They were pretty expensive back then as well. Nowadays, the advantage is everything is at the tip of your finger. Um, on the flip side, I guess, you know, the industry is pretty big. So there's probably a lot of opportunities as well. But there's also a lot of people. So if you want to stand out, um, there's not going to be any shortcuts either, though. I think it's work, 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 practice, 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 and renew your 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 portfolio and your your demo um you know it's fine to hey that's six months old it's one year old chuck it and and, and maybe redo the same thing but it's going to be better already and uh absolutely if it doesn't lend you a job at the very least it's going to let you get in school and then once you get in school instead of just kind of freaking out because of all the information that is coming your way, you're going to already be halfway there, right? So you're going to be a few steps ahead of the other classmates that you have because already 
your brain and hands and whatnot are going to be in motion. Uh, whereas, yeah, they will be maybe stunned by everything that's coming at once. So I don't think it's something that uh, you do for nothing. And Last then, week and we maybe... talked with Leo, who's our Web3 developer, yeah. and we were talking about game jams and how game jams can be helpful not only to learn the skills that you need and to improve those skills, but also to build your network. Now, you mentioned, you know, by this point, you could go to school. I'm American. Yep. School isn't always an option for us. Or yeah. you know, higher higher education is not. High school level is getting better about having some of the classes that would help somebody who wanted to get into game design. But mm-hmm. to go to some nice school of digital arts isn't going to be possible for everybody. Do you have to have a degree to be a game designer? No, I No, I don't think so uh, of course there is the the achievement and the right of passage i guess that it represents um, but uh, i mean the tools are so democratized nowadays that i mean if you have the means to support yourself and the drive and the talent and potentially the um, the network, depending on the scope of what you're trying to do. Uh, there's a lot of people that are actually uh, publishing games with one, two, three man teams. And, you know, some of them are pretty good. And, you know, you, you get a few of those. And at some point, uh, just on the merit of, of what you've been doing, I think uh, chances are you might land a job regardless. You know, the what's yeah. important is to be able to provide skills that, you know the 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 employer that you're contacting needs, and then maybe they they won't care that much. And yeah, with every company I've worked at, they didn't just hire a game designer; they filled those positions from within, and it was yeah. usually the people who were in quality assurance or yeah. uh, the tech support people. You, one of those uh, like entry level design positions would open. It was like throwing a stake into a tiger pit. Mm. Um, is that still the case, or do you hire from externally where somebody can just come in and be a game designer? I, For I like value... an entry level. Obviously, if somebody's released a game, then they've proven that they can do that. And they're somewhere they're more else. Likely. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I value a lot actually uh, quality uh, assurance and and uh, as as an experience uh, as an entry point to a, to a game design position because uh, good QAs uh, they're gonna be very thorough and uh, you know game design uh, we're not playing games day in day out uh, more oh, often than not. Oh come on, that's what everybody <laughs> says. Oh, it must be fun to just play games all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you, you're gonna spend a lot of time in Excel. You're gonna spend a lot of time in 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 Word. You're gonna spend a lot of time in. Uh, I actually prefer PowerPoints and presentations to to actually wall of text. So, in those type of programs, and then in the engine, and and you know, tweaking numbers and and, and prototyping things and and whatnot. So, I think um, it's a it's a very good um staging ground or and then you know some you see that they have the knack that's gonna carry them beyond uh and then others maybe they they need a little bit more seasoning but i definitely do look for that and value that for for junior positions to the extent that i would say don't worry if you come out of school and you don't land a job as you know anything really in the game industry do get do try to get your feet into qa and and generally uh and even you know if you've self-taught or if you're coming out of school having that and the passion about games is generally going to get you your foot in as a qa right and then if you keep on pushing and you keep on working and you keep on you know coming back every few months with hey check this out i've done that the people you're working with uh, they're gonna have you in mind and and you know so sooner and later a position's gonna open that's a good fit for you and then and then there you go 
And even as somebody who's working in QA or uh, any of the other departments, you know, if you're an artist or whatnot, uh, most of the time, not always, but most of the time you'll get some input into the game design because as a tester and you're going, okay, this just really doesn't feel good. You know, yeah. the way that this moves and maybe we need to change this. Uh, so you still get a taste of that. And yeah. you also learn how to give that feedback better. Yeah. Uh, one of the important things, if you want to be a game designer, and please uh, disagree with me or agree with me, because that's why I'm bringing this up, is yeah. that I've encouraged people, when you're playing a game, if you want to be a game designer, when you're playing a game, don't just go like, oh, this game is great. This game is terrible. Think about why. What is it about that game that you like? What is it about that game that you don't like? What is it about the combat or the you know game systems in general? Do you find that too? Like you want people to be able to say why they like it. Is that important if you're a game designer? If you come to me in an interview, I'm definitely going to come at you with, with exactly those questions. And I'm going to want <laughs> you to speak to me about um, exactly those points, right? Uh, you know, name me a game that uh, you thought was so-so and why, and then what would you have done different? And uh, I mean, I like to have, you know, those candidates, if we go down that interview angle again, to talk a lot, um, simply because it gives me an insight uh, into, you know, where they're coming from, what they know, uh, what they've done, um, their understanding of you know game concepts and that kind of stuff so definitely it's it's a good exercise um it's a definitely a good exercise to do okay so let's let's shift into some more personal stuff not too personal but just to get to know you a little bit better and yeah. you were mentioning earlier about how you like to garden mm. but you are the only person i have ever known in my Many, many years. I'm not going to say how old I am, but I'm fucking old. Uh, I've never known anybody else who lived on a houseboat. Like, not a houseboat. A, it's a it's a forty four a boat foot, boat forty four foot sailboat. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Which you recently uh, docked because it's winter time and you can't. It's not a good idea to live on the boat in the winter. Uh, no, but, it's more that uh, it's a it's a nineteen eighty three. So you know it's got some mileage under its belt. Uh, I bought it in in November of uh, twenty one. Um, I was hoping that uh, because we could still be out there. I mean, this weekend they're forecasting twenty five and twenty eight, which is. 75 and 80 some i guess in fahrenheit and and big sun so we're definitely going to be swimming this weekend uh, i'm not in berlin uh, right now <laughs> oh where are you but, right now uh, i'm in the south of france still that's where the boat oh, okay. is right um so yes uh, i bought the boat with the knowledge that i would need to to do a lot of uh, upgrades and whatnot so that's why we kind of cut the season short because october has been lovely uh this year uh, just so that we can make sure that from a safety point of view and from a functionality point of view um, everything would be up to snuff so new sales and, and all of that's going to be a beauty uh, next year and when you bought it the plan was to live on the boat yeah the big project that i did this season was to overhaul pretty much all of the electric electricity and, and electronics system so now it's got the uh, one big solar array on the arch on the back arch uh, so we're independent we're autonomous uh, from an electricity point of view and i mean you know we got two workstations in there uh, with you know the second screen and uh, got an electric barbecue and everything's moving to electric so uh, so that was pretty swell we'd just be working off at anchor is it just you, or do you have boatmates? Oh, since with the significant other might be watching. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> is it like my husband is obsessed with these tiny house shows? Except yeah. there's no way like he could never live in a tiny house. He's like, yeah, I would have to get like six or eight of them, and put them together. And I was like, isn't that a house? But is it the equivalent? Like, what are some of the challenges? And the benefits to having such a small 
living space, especially at least with a tiny house, you can have it where you can get in your car or go to the store. If you're you out, yeah, it's called a, it's called a dinghy, <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's parked at the back of the boat, and we go do the groceries in the port uh, with it. Um, when you're when you're looking for a boat, uh, and I guess we're going completely somewhere else right now, but you know, you, it's a balance of what age is it, how big it is, and, and and its condition and its equipment, I guess. So that's why we went for a little bit older, so that we could get something that's a little bit bigger. So we actually have, you know, a, a nice nice living area um, on the boat. I mean, it's not, it's like a small studio still. You know, it's, it's I don't know, probably uh, five hundred square feet of living space maybe something like that or not even 44 times 4 so that's 44 times 12 yeah it's probably something like that but uh your your backyard is wherever you're at anchor right so the benefits is that uh, between uh, meeting uh, I, I go outside i jump i go for a swim dry <laughs> out and then i come back in and 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 uh put my headphones back on and dive in into what I was doing, right? So um, sundowners are a definite plus. And then, uh, you know, maybe it's the ADD that's uh, gotten the better of us, but the, the, the <laughs> opportunity to change your landscape every so often because the weather is the bus, right? Uh, you don't want to be caught in a bad spot on a sailboat. So so you're always kind of the lookout for that, but makes you change anchorages and change spots and whatnot. And you're always kind of exploring and seeing new things. So, yeah. Do, do you get to grow some vegetables, fruits and vegetables on the boat? This is, this is the question that I wanted to ask yeah. earlier. But I was like, no, <laughs> wait till you're talking about the boat. We we were growing herbs because we 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 both like to cook a lot. So we had a pretty fat plant of uh, of of basil and uh, you know the, the thyme and those staples, I guess, of the Mediterranean cuisine. I would think that but like no, vertical no gardening yeah. would work well. Have, we're prob- have you tried? We're probably going to try. Yeah, because the solar arch in the back, I think uh, we might try a few tomatoes and whatnot. We'll see. Uh, so when you brought the boat in a few weeks ago, yeah. you like you said, you, you bought it what was at the beginning of the COVID thing and you're out there on your boat living your best life, you dock <laughs> the boat and it's like, it, it sounded to me like you're just, you get off the boat, you're walking down the street, <coughs> you have COVID. Yeah. Were you yeah, like, uh, F this, I'm going back on the boat. Yeah, screw all of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, it's the reason why uh, we we switch around me and Neo, I guess, for these uh, these uh, meet the teams uh, because I was just floored. Um, it was my you are, second. And then bump. Leo got his COVID booster shot, and then he was kind of wiped out, but yeah, not as not as in as bad a shape as you were. So he, he yeah, powered through it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was payback for all the good times we had this summer, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've heard from people when they, once they get through it, and and you, you recovered probably more quickly than other people that I've heard of. It was like a, a maybe a week of it being really bad, and then you that started was my to second feel bout, better. actually. Oh, you we had were... it before? Yeah, we were early adopters uh, when Italy <laughs> was burning adopter. down. <laughs> we went to to Prague actually, and uh, and 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 the train to bring us back to Berlin was a replacement train that was late. Everyone was coming back from their ski uh, time off in the winter. Uh, the replacement train, the windows didn't open. They didn't uh, replace the soap and the toilet paper, and it was packed and it took like six hours instead of four to get back up so we don't you know ask ourselves where we got it the first time around but we're pretty <laughs> that's certain pretty that's obvious. where it was and back then there was not even enough tests so uh, yeah it was pretty hectic um, hectic times and then we didn't even know what's what right it's uh, when when my girlfriend actually started stopping tasting and, and and smelling things that uh, there was some reports that were starting to come out that that was one of the 
of the of the of the symptoms and that's we realized that yeah okay that's what we've been feeling like crap for and that was before we got vaccinated as well so i didn't get that but i i never get headaches but when i get covid i just it's like my head wanna split yeah fun times i'm glad you're better now yeah feeling better now. we just don't go around people we have food delivered and we just stay home <laughs> I don't yeah. like being around people anyway. Uh, what do you do with your free time when you're not on the boat? What's your life like when you're when you're landlocked? Uh, weeks tends to go by quickly, right? And we we like to cook. So one of the things that always get organized through through the weeks is uh, okay, what's on the menu next week? Uh, so so then there's always a chunk of the of the weekend that's that's for that i guess getting what we need and then and then just uh cooking up what's your Playing signature games. dish what's your signature the signature dish, dish. Uh, <laughs> tonight actually i made that big pork roast with the ribs right but the whole thing that i i stab with the garlic cloves and then i make the like a uh, this time around it was uh, maple syrup of course and uh and, and mustard crusting with herbs and then you let the little potatoes kind of uh grill up around it with the with the juices that's uh that's cooking uh, around it so uh, that's that's a classic i guess it, yeah it looked pretty that's tasty when i saw the photo uh, one of the, the there are so many benefits to traveling and listen, living in different places and one of the things that i found was that i would go to different countries or, you know, different states, different cities, whatever. And you find something there that you love yeah. and you can't get it back home. Like what are some of the things that you get homesick for as far as food is concerned? Like poutine. Do you miss that? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Right where I was going. Uh, <laughs> we can't get the cheese, right? So, uh, or you know, if you look, there's some places in France and in Germany uh, where you can actually get it, but you know, it's not gonna be as fresh and tasty and squeaky because it's squeaks uh, that puts in cheese. But you definitely can get some some nice French fries. So and then I do my own sauce from scratch with a nice tang and zing. So 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 I think we can we can actually get by uh, that. I really like lobster as well. Uh, so that's a, something else that you don't really have in Europe uh, either. So whenever I go back home, uh, it's, the fish market is the first stop. <laughs> uh, we have a question from the uh, YouTube chat. Uh, yeah. They want to know what your favorite tabletop game is. Do you do a lot of tabletop gaming? Yeah. Um, I guess it kind of fell this on the wayside a little bit, but Settlers of Catan definitely. I mean, I don't know where the box is, but it's weird and teared, and it's we've played so many games uh, of 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 that one that uh, it's you know big classic. Cards Against Humanity is is one of the ones that's been played the most in the recent years. I guess it's a little bit easier, and uh, it's hilarious. So. Um, and then you know you got good old Monopoly and Risk. That uh, in my last few years in Montreal, we'd often have uh, dinner and board game parties uh, on Fridays, where you know my brother and my and my friends would come over, and we'd be like a good sized group, and you know the stakes would be rising uh, around a game of Monopoly or. Sydney, yeah, I mean, I there guess. are families that stop talking to each other over Monopoly and Risk. Yeah. Have you played the new Super Mario version of Monopoly? Uh, I've seen it, but I haven't. Uh, I haven't played it. It goes so much faster. And my niece was here with her two kids, yeah. and they were little slum lords. They were just <laughs> ruthless. And I'm sitting at the table, like I could not land on a property that was available. I just kept landing on the property of these little slum lords and finally i was just like jesus just take me out jesus yeah. just take me out of this game and then my next role it wiped me out 
Yeah, children I, are as, ruthless. Yeah, ruthless. Opinion. As a good game designer, uh, we quickly came up with with house rules, be it for for risk or or monopoly, right? And as soon as you make him clear from the get go, then it's not cheating, right? Everybody's on the same page. But we had some game, some some house rules uh, so that the game would would start a little bit quicker and be more entertaining. What are the things that you find the most exciting? about Noor, about the project that you're working on now? The the development philosophy, I think, is one of the first things that we discussed in that initial meeting with with, uh, with Brooks and, and, and Frederick. And from the get-go, it was clear that um, there wouldn't be uh, any uh, permeation of the, the monetization uh, that would go into the the, the gameplay loops, uh, right? So it's definitely not, um, you know, we don't want to be like the rest of the industry, what they've been doing so far. We're going completely uh, somewhere else. So uh, in the game department, we're empowered to actually just focus on 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 pure gameplay, and. Um, Another thing that we don't want to do either is kind of hide in our cave for years, just promising stuff and never really be able to to show anything or put anything in or, you know, it takes a long time before you can put things in, in, in people's hands. So one of the ways that we decided we wanted to, to go at it is to um, identify uh, specific game loops. Uh, and 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 develop them, flesh them out, and then um, have a faster turnaround rate to actually put things in people's hands. So I'm not I'm not going with release dates or anything right now, but uh, we definitely um, <laughs> I don't want to paint myself in a corner either. But uh, I don't want you to paint us into a corner. <laughs> so I'm very grateful. Thank you. But uh, yeah, the idea is is to bring the community in uh, with interesting games, but that are of a narrower scope, uh, but at the same time that we intend to leverage to uh, mash them together so that we can start building bigger things quicker and, and then bringing them to, to the community again. Uh, yeah, so that's a little bit what we've been up to of late. Are you good at PvP? Are you going to be one of the people we should fear in the Arena Perilous? In the yeah, in the Arena Perilous, uh, yeah, it depends on it depends on the game, I guess. And uh, but uh, you know, I've had my share of uh, in MMOs. Like you know, uh, I was definitely on on PvP servers way back when in WoW and in Warhammer Online and that type of stuff. Maybe a little bit less on the on the first person shooter side of things, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see. Well, I'll see you out there. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Enjoy your evening. I know it's getting late there, and this was great talking to you. Thanks for being the last one that I get to interview. Uh, pray for, for me, me that you know Brooks won't. Go Geraldo Rivera on me on, on November 4th. Next week, instead of the Meet the Team episode, that's why we're skipping a week, as next week is our monthly AMA. And you can get information about that in our Discord. And talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for having me. It was fun. <laughs>